we've seen how the, we can solve our model of Slack with a fixed price. Uh, now what we can do is uh, look at comparative statics. That is how the model responds to shocks to the various uh, parameters. Uh, that will allow us to see how the model responds to um, aggregate demand shocks, aggregate supply shocks, um, and also it will allow us to contrast um, how the economy behaves in response to these various shocks. And then, you know, down the line, once we have uh, access to data, uh, that will allow us to separate um, aggregate demand from aggregate supply shock in the real world. Um, so let's start with uh, aggregate supply shocks here in the model. Let's look at comparative statics. So we'll change, uh, you know, we'll change the parameters that uh, pin down the aggregate supply and see how um, the solution of the model changes. So first step is um, aggregate supply shocks. And so uh, what's an aggregate supply shock? Well, so it's a shock that shifts um, the aggregate supply. Now you remember that the aggregate supply here is uh, basically determined by um, the matching function, but this is something that we're not going to touch, and the capacity. So here we're going to look at a change in um, capacity. So we're going to look at an increase in the capacity K. Uh, and of course, you know, you could do the decrease. It's uh, exactly uh, the same. Um, all right. So how do we do the comparative static? So the idea is you start from a low capacity. You uh, change the parameter value to a high capacity. You want to see how um, the model changes. And for that, the best is to use a graphical representation of the model solution. And then in there, look at what happens. Right, so on the vertical um, axis, I have my tightness x. On my horizontal axis, I have my quantity y. Here, I have 0. Here, I have k, the capacity. <coughs> right, so then I have uh, my aggregate demand. It's going to look something like this. Here, we know that uh, the aggregate demand we know that it's zero at xm. <clears throat> when tightness is zero, um, the aggregate demand has some uh, value here. So this is yd, and the expression for yd, which we can have here so we don't forget, x epsilon, one plus tau x, epsilon minus one, mu over p. <clears throat> Okay, um, and then I have my aggregate supply. Okay, and so this is ys, which is f of x times k. Uh, all right, and it starts at zero here. <coughs> okay, um, and here, so I have my old. So here I have my old tightness and my old output. All right, so now we are looking at an uh, aggregate supply shock, an increase in capacity. So let's see what happens. Uh, increase in K. So if K goes up, we'll have a higher capacity in the economy, something like this. Right, so that's the underlying shock that we are um, considering. Okay, so aggregate demand, you can see that none of the, of course, none of the parameters of the aggregate demand move. That, that's why we are looking at an aggregate supply shocks. So aggregate demand remains the same. The aggregate supply, of course, is going to shift because you see that the aggregate supply is proportional to K. So we'll have a new aggregate supply that looks maybe something like this. <coughs> 
And so this is because, uh, you know, the parameter K is the expression of the aggregate supply has changed. So what happens to the solution of our model? Well, you can see that now I had an old solution that was here, and now I have a new solution that's going to be here. Um, so we can see immediately what happens to tightness. So tightness is going to fall. And what happens to output? Output is going to increase. So when you have a positive aggregate supply shock, I'm going to call this new tightness X prime, this new output Y prime. <coughs> Basically, we've moved from here to here. Okay, and this is our new, this is our new solution. Okay, and so from that we can learn uh, actually a whole whole range of things. So let's summarize uh, the result from the comparative statics here. So when K, the capacity goes up, what do we have? So first of all, <coughs> tightness X is going to fall. So also this is a positive um, aggregate supply shock, the labor market, because the economy becomes less tight. And the economy, the idea, of course, is that there's the same amount of aggregate demand. You supply more services to your economy. Of course, you know, you'll have a less tight economy. Uh, so that's just the intuition. <coughs> then output Y is going to increase, as we saw. What's the intuition for that? Well, yeah, you have some amount of demand, but you supply more services. Um, and so, you know, that's going to, um, with more services being available, uh, you'll, uh, you'll have more uh, output as well. It's just because it's going to be, everything else equal, it's going to be easier for households to find services because there are more services um, available. And as it becomes easier to find services with a, you know, with a lower tightness, the probability to fill but a visit to be successful is higher, so it becomes relatively easier to find services, and so that makes buying services more attractive. And so um, overall, you know, there'll be more trades that will be realized in this economy where, uh, where you have more services available. Uh, in fact, so because the tightness has fallen, what we know <coughs> is that um, the buying probability, which is Q of X, the buying probability is going to increase. Um, that's because, you know, when tightness is lower, your visits are more likely uh, to be successful. Very related to that, the matching wage tau x uh, is going to go down. Uh, well, yeah, that's because, um, you know, your visits are more likely to be successful, um, so you spend overall less resources on, on visits, and so the wedge between consumption and output um, is going to drop. <clears throat> now what happens to the selling probability? Uh, F of X, well, that's going to drop because we know that F is an increasing function of tightness. So the idea is that now you have roughly the same amount of demand, you have many more services available, so the competition across services is fiercer, um, so each service is less likely to be sold. Selling probability falls, but we know that in this model, selling probability is also the same as measured productivity, because you know if you wanted to measure productivity, capital and labor here as fixed, you look at how many, uh, if you want to look, but how do this capital and labor translate into sales, into output? That's through f of x. You know that output is f of x and k. So if you just measured how much output comes out of this amount of labor and services that's here, uh, and you call that measure productivity, then your measure productivity is just the same as a selling probability. Um, and so, you know, if you measure productivity as a residual between output and labor and on capital, you would just measure the selling probability. So the fact that the selling probability drops, it means that measure probability, measure productivity would also fall here. So a positive aggregate supply shock would look like uh, a drop in uh, measured productivity. <coughs> 
okay? Uh, what happened to, uh, so K goes up, output uh, goes up. What happened to the rate of idleness? Well, the rate of idleness is going to increase because you have more services available for roughly the same amount of demand. And so people are going to be more idle on the job. So selling probability drop, uh, rate of idleness, which is one minus F of X, that's going to increase. So although you have more output that's sold, uh, people are more idle, okay? Um, so the increase in supply leads both to more transactions, but also more idleness. So output and idleness uh, here uh, are both going to actually increase uh, under this increase in capacity. The last thing we can look at is what happens to consumption. Um, so consumption C, we know that it's <coughs> output divided by one plus tau x. Now, with, uh, so consumption is going to uh, benefit from an increase in aggregate supply. We know that output goes up. Um, and we also know that because tightness fall, the matching wedge is going to fall. So you have both more output, a lower weight. So for both reasons, consumption is going to increase. Uh, so consumption is really benefits from an increase in aggregate supply. So these are all the, all these are all the effects of an increase in aggregate supply. Uh, what I want to flag here, that's I think very important. So you, when you have a positive aggregate supply shock, what skis at output and tightness move in opposite direction. So an increase in aggregate supply is good for output, but it's going to uh, reduce tightness with everything that comes with it. And in particular, it's going to increase uh, idleness here. So that's a key uh, that's a key pattern that we have with aggregate supply shock. So now let's look at an aggregate demand shock, and we see that things would be um, quite different. So here we're looking at an added shock. So what's an added shock? So it's a shock that uh, boosts aggregate demand. And in fact, we can go up a little bit here to our expression of the aggregate demand curve. So you can see that there are um, two things that can boost your aggregate demand. You can have either an increase in the parameter uh, in the parameter key, which says how much households want to consume versus whole real wealth. And you can also have an increase in uh, the endowment of real wealth. Uh, both of these things are going to boost aggregate demand. <coughs> So an aggregate demand shock can be uh, a positive aggregate demand shock can be an increase in key, which is a parameter that dictates how much you value services which was uh, compared to uh, holding real wealth. So when key goes up, you value services more. So that's going to boost aggregate demand for services. Or it can be an increase in mu, the endowment of real wealth. Uh, when there is more real wealth around, that also boosts uh, aggregate demand. Uh, and so why is that? Here's intuition is not exactly uh, what you might think. So it's not, it's not because if you increase mu, the endowment uh, of wealth, people have more wealth and they're going to spend more. That's not what happens here, of course, in the model, because at the end of the day, what is spent is an income for somebody else. So in aggregate, you have the same wealth initially and at the end of the day. Right, so aggregate wealth holdings at the end of the day are exactly the same as the end amount of real wealth. So if you, so it's you know, uh, it, it's not the case that somehow if you increase real wealth, people are going to uh, spend a bigger fraction of that at the end of the day. Once we, you know, once we solve the model, uh, you know, the wealth that was there to start is also the wealth that's there uh, that's there. Uh, to finish. So there's no amount of that wealth that's actually spent. You know, everything is going to be, uh, you know, if you have heterogeneity, it may shift, shift hands a little bit, but at the end, uh, none of that endowment of wealth is going to be spent. But what happens is that if you have more um, wealth in the economy, remember that households, they value in their utility functions, they value both consumption of services and all holding wealth. If you have more wealth, because you have a concave utility function, your marginal utility of wealth is going to be lower. Okay, uh, But households, when they behave optimally, what they try to do is equalize the marginal utility of wealth and the marginal utility uh, of uh, consumption of services, you know, to maximize their utility. It wouldn't make sense uh, 
you know, to spend so much more on something else and have vastly different marginal utilities. You don't want that. Uh, so you want to equalize them, you know, of course, uh, up to the price differences. Um, but so if you increase the amount of wealth in the economy, you are going to reduce, uh, you're going to reduce the marginal utility from wealth. And so because households try to balance marginal utility of wealth, marginal utility of services, they are going to want to consume more services uh, to also, you know, end up with a lower marginal utility of services so that the two marginal utility are balanced again. Uh, so that, that's how uh, an increase in wealth is going to boost aggregate demand is because it's going to uh, reduce marginal utility of wealth and therefore uh, it would lead also to higher consumption of services so that that marginal utility is equally reduced. Uh, so that's, that's how things work. So now what's the effect of an increase in aggregate demand? So we can, uh, we can, do, uh, can look at that in a diagram again, the same diagram. All right, so here I have my aggregate supply. This is not going to be affected by uh, this is not going to be affected by the aggregate demand shock. Let's see. Uh, yes. So I have my aggregate supply here. I have my initial uh, aggregate demand here. Uh, so here I should have said again as usual I have x here on the horizontal axis. I have y. Uh, this is uh, the tightness XM. Here I have zero. Here I have my intercept of my aggregate demand. <coughs> Here I have my initial model solution. So I have X, oops. the initial X and the initial Y and the initial solution. Okay, so now let's look at an increase in aggregate demand. So we said we're going to increase X, or we're going to increase mu. Uh, YD, oops, do you remember that the expression is key epsilon, one plus star X, epsilon minus one, mu over P. So whether you increase mu or you increase key, that's going to boost the aggregate demand to something like this. So we'll get a new aggregate demand that's going to look something like this. Oops, uh, here I've been a bit. Uh... Okay, uh, of course, XM, so here you can see you have a rotation around this point. XM doesn't change because XM is a point where tau X uh, is infinite. Uh, and of course, whether you change key or whether you change mu, that's not affecting XM. So here, the aggregate demand is going to rotate around that point here. Uh, and so you can see that now we have a new uh, solution of the model. That solution is going to be here. So what do we see? We see that, of course, now that we have a tightness, oops, uh, we have a tightness that's much higher. What happens to output? Output is also going to be much higher. as we can see here. So that's what's going to happen. Uh, you can see that when you boost aggregate demand, so either uh, by increasing key or by increasing mu, uh, you're going to have a market that's tighter and you're going to have more output. So we can summarize, uh, we can summarize all of this and explain a little bit what happens. So here we are looking at a positive aggregate demand shock. So that's going to be uh, an increase in key or mu. Um, so what's going to happen? Uh, so first we've seen that uh, tightness X, that's going to increase when we have our positive aggregate demand shock. So here is just people want to consume more services. They are going to do more visits. Uh, and so you'll have uh, a tighter market. What happens to output? Well, we saw that that also increases. Uh, you know, people do more visits. Uh, that, through the matching function, 
invariably that leads to uh, more trades, more matchings, more output. Uh, the buying probability Q of X that's going to fall. Well, that's because um, you have households want, they do more visits, they want to buy more stuff. And so there is more competition ac across buyers. And so for each visit, it's less likely to be successful. Because each visit is less likely to be successful, households will tend to spend more resources on matching. So the matching wedge tau of X is going to uh, increase. So matching becomes more costly for households when you have this like uh, very tight economy with very high aggregate demand. So if you want, this would be like what happens after the pandemic, big amount of aggregate demand, very tight market, very big matching wage. So uh, households spend a lot of resources on uh, buying stuff. Of course, if you're a seller in this tight economy, that's very good. So the selling probability f of x, that's going to increase. Uh, and measure productivity. So once more, if you measure productivity in this world, what you would be capturing is a selling probability. So it looks like it looks like uh, workers are more productive. It's not that they are more productive; they have the same productivity, but they sell more stuff due to the increased aggregate demand. But so in any case, this higher tightness would look like an increase in measured productivity, an increase in productivity. So measured productivity goes up. And in fact, that's often what happens, you know. Uh, it looks like productivity is procyclical. Good times, people are productive. Bad times are not productive. But, you know, what really happens is that in good times, uh, people are more busy. They're able to sell more stuff and because there is more demand. In bad times, they're less busy and they're able to sell fewer things because there's less demand. And so it looks like productivity changes when it just changes in idleness. Um, Okay, so measured productivity is going to increase. Um, as we said, the rate of idleness, rate of idleness, which is just one minus f of x, that's going to drop. So people are going to be much more busy, much less idle. Consumption, on the other hand, we can't say what happens actually. So consumption c it's y over one plus tau x. Output y goes up, but the matching wedge also goes up. And so in fact, it will depend on the situation to know whether. Uh, consumption goes up or goes down. So to summarize, you know, the key thing, the key difference with a, between a supply shock and a demand shock is that a positive, so both a positive demand and positive supply shock lead to a higher output. But the key thing is that a positive supply shock leads to lower tightness, whereas a, a positive demand shock leads to higher tightness. So that's the key thing. Uh, so positive supply shock leads to more idleness. A positive demand shock leads to less idleness. That's really the, the key. And once you look at the data, that's what you can use to separate between these two types, uh, between these two types of shocks.